he's challenging us to no longer be afraid of the refiner, to no longer be afraid of the fire because the fire is only intended to burn away the waste. You're not waste, therefore you cannot get burned. Is it uncomfortable? Yes. Do we want to go through it? No. <laughs> We've been through the fire. We, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one here that's been through some fire before. Come on. But did you make it out? Stronger? Shining? Ready for the next task? God is saying, don't be afraid of the fire. Because in order for you to get to the next level, I've got to burn some things away that was accumulated on this journey. So it, it, the fire has nothing to do about you. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with anything you've done wrong or, or any level of punishment. God is already looking forward to the next season. And he's saying, I got to get these things off of you that you may not see so that it does not affect how you handle your next blessing. He said, don't be afraid to be tried by the fire because you will come out purified. Do so, Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be sharpened with my fellow brothers and sisters by your word. And Lord, there's plenty of imperfections in me, but I know that your word is perfect. So my prayer is that all of me is decreased so that all of you can increase and that the word that goes forward will go forward perfectly and it will set out and accomplish what it was sent to do so that we all will be sharpened and we all will be made stronger because of you. Lord, I pray that your presence changes us today. And I pray a blessing over other ministries this morning that are delivering your word as well. We know that you're omnipresent and you, you can bless <laughs> anywhere, anytime. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. I want to ask you guys before we go into the word that if you just check your phones briefly and Make sure that you silence them. My friendly reminder is that the Lord will not call you during church. Amen. He's going to speak loudly through whomever is speaking the word that day. If you don't mind doing that, that would be awesome. This morning I have a word that I believe is going to bless all of us today. And these are the scriptural references that we're going to be speaking from. So I'll get out of the way. I know sometimes you guys take pictures and I'm like right in the middle of it. So I will move. These will be the scripture references that we're going to refer to. And our first reading for the day is going to come from 1 Samuel chapter 18 verses 1 through 4. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. And once you get there, let me hear amen so I know to begin. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So starting in verse 1, it says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. And Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword with bow, his bow and his belt. And I want to also flip over to Ecclesiastes. I'm going to read the first three um, scriptures before we even get into the word. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. And it says, 
two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. I'm going somewhere, y'all. Y'all stay with me. I'm going to take you to Romans, and then we'll get into the Word. We're going to go to Romans, chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. And it says, you see, at just the right time, mm -hmm, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so I want to speak to you guys from a topic. I've got a friend. I've got a friend. <laughs> I've got a friend. And, and I, I chose to speak about David early on because David went through a lot of hardships when it came to the friends that he cared about. King Saul changed his heart and tried to kill David. David's own son, Absalom, tried to usurp his throne and the person he entrusted the most within his court betrayed him. And in his life, David had both a conspiring companion and a friend that he viewed as close as family. He had a personal advisor and close companion named Ahithophel that turned traitor by joining David's son Absalom in a plot against his divinely authorized kingship. But through it all, <laughs> there was a friend that he had that stuck closer than a brother. David had seven brothers, but none of them were as close to him as his older friend, Jonathan, the son of King Saul. And his unselfish friendship with David manifested into a loyal covenant between the two of them. And in spite of all his hardships with building credible friendships, there were two total that he could confide in. And the first one I want to speak about is Jonathan, his best friend, who advised and protected David from his father, King Saul, as well as those who went against his kingship. And Jonathan was so committed to David that he risked his own life against his own father to save the life of his friend, one who he esteemed as an anointed heir to the throne. Now, Jonathan was rightfully the next in line to become king because his dad, Saul, was already king. So he, growing up, understood that when Pops moves on, I'm going to be the next king. That's just the way things work. You didn't have to apply for it. Come on, somebody. You didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to do anything for it. It was inherited. It was passed on naturally to the oldest son. And so Jonathan grew up knowing that one day he was going to be king. Could you imagine your life yeah. growing up knowing that someday a mantle is going to be passed down to you to be ruler over a land that belonged to God? Jonathan grew up with that in his mind. And then later found out plans changed. <laughs> and so before I even go deeper with that, one of the things we got to realize is that being a friend requires a similar mindset of going into a relationship. I'm giving up me for the sake of you. And in return, you're giving up you for the sake of me. I'm thinking highly of you above myself because that's the kingdom way. 
But what I've learned and I realized when I was reading this text and studying this thing is that a lot of folks don't know how to be a friend because we never learn how to long suffer or sacrifice for people or situations that we don't benefit from. I don't know if I need to say that again, but I'm going to say it anyway. Mm -mm -mm. A lot of folks don't know how to be a friend because we never learn how to long suffer or sacrifice for people or situations that we don't benefit from. We've learned how to walk away from stuff if we don't see how we're going to grow and how we're going to benefit from it. We've learned to say that's your battle, not mine. We've learned to say, I'll pray for you, good luck. We're good at that, right? We, we, we're good at, I will pray for you. And a lot of times we forget to do it anyway, right? Can we keep it real? But I think about the relationship with Jonathan and David. Jonathan didn't choose to be David's friend because of David's dreams. He didn't choose to be David's friends because of the benefits of being connected to him. He became David's best friends because he spent time getting to know David long before the call to kingship. He loved David because he developed a relationship with David. And see, when Jonathan had every right to feel like he was above David, he humbled himself and served David. Think about this for a minute. If I'm growing up with you and I know my dad's the king, I know for a fact that at some point I'm going to be king. You're not going to be king because my dad's the king. But even in knowing all of this, Jonathan still allowed himself to be friendly with someone that would never be equal to him in his eyes of stature. When there was no benefit to himself, he chose to be friends with David. At best, he'd give you a job in the kingdom, right? But you'll never be on the level this is the mindset. You'll never be at the level of him because he's the next in line to be king. And knowing this at the time, Jonathan was still in fellowship with David. He didn't allow that to change how he treated him. But then he heard a word from the Lord that even though you're legally next in line to be king, David is my chosen one. Come on, somebody. Y'all know how, how, how hurtful that could be, how that could really do something to your pride when you're growing up and everybody's just like, I can't wait to see how you're going to be king. You're going to be the next king of all this land. And you're growing up and your, your mindset is I'm the next king. And then all of a sudden the word of the Lord comes and says, no, Jonathan, it's not going to be you. It's someone who doesn't even have the same blood as you. That's my chosen one. That's the next person that I'm picking to be king. Does it mean you're a bad person? It just means that you're not in my plans right now. Even though it came from God, it still hurts. But one of the things we can learn from this is that when Jonathan realized that it was no longer going to be him that's going to be king, but his friend that's going to be king, his love for David never changed. Y'all, I don't know if y'all getting this or not. He could have allowed his relationship with David to shift from close to jealousy. See, because that's what happens when you don't have a real relationship. Let's think about Saul for a minute. Saul and David did not have a strong relationship. So when David started getting elevated and people started celebrating David's success, Saul became jealous. Saul became envious, but not Jonathan, his own son, because Jonathan took time and built a relationship with David. You can tell the vulnerability in this time of, of, of David's life because the first thing that would cross his mind, first of all, he's grateful that God would call him. But man, what, what is my friend going to think? What is Saul's own son going to think about me? Is he going to think I try to conspire against him? Are we going to still remain friends? Are we still going to be close as we were before? Because obviously I'm taking a position that was rightfully his. And one of the things we can learn from this bond is that 
when folk can love on you when you have nothing and it appears that they're further along than you are they may have more than you they may be in line to receive more than you could ever imagine and their connection to you appears to profit you more than it profits them but yet they still cover you they still protect you they still hide you from the attacks of others they still use their resources to bless you but then watch this when the tables shift and you find out that the blessings that they had hoped for that they would receive are now the blessings that you're going to get instead and that God was going to elevate you instead of elevating them that they don't become bitter because they're not moved by your elevation but because of their stance with you the position that you now carry does not change how they feel about you when you got somebody like that you've got a friend because my friendship to you was never predicated on what you can do for me nor my ability to control you it was always based on the bond we both nurtured together and nothing can come between that not even my family it takes an intentional effort to be a friend and we've watered down what it means to be a friend in today's society because you know you got social media you click a button and we're friends right and I can click a button and that means I'm gonna follow you there's no connection like it used to be back in the day where you actually built and established and you worked towards something nowadays the word friend is being used just as lo loose as the word love to a point where we don't even know what a friend looks like anymore we don't even know what love looks like anymore we use the word so loosely that everything looks like love just because you smile at me it means you love me just because you pat me on the back it means you love me come on somebody a pat on the back is no far behind than a, a y'all know y'all know the rest come on somebody <laughs> but we don't even recognize love and we don't recognize the false love because everything looks the same we don't recognize friendship and we don't recognize false friendship because everything looks the same and so Jonathan chose David over his own family because as a man of God even Jesus said who are my brothers and sisters but those who do the will of God y'all with me now so he understood that his family his bond as a man of God is to those who are in the will of God not just to those he's related to and, and there's there's a saying I know the saying about blood being thicker than water we say that all the time it's a fact blood is thicker than water um, basically it's saying that you know the family bond will always be stronger than the bond of someone who is not in your family um, but if you know me I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge that y'all know I'm quick to challenge the, what, what the world says blood is thicker than water but blood is comprised mostly of water I had to look this up to make sure I was right now because if I ain't right I, I'm wrong right Blood is thicker than water, but blood is comprised mostly of water. 80% of blood is water. So you cannot even begin to establish blood unless there is a presence of water. It's the water that makes the blood flow. Come on, somebody. I need y'all to get this. It's, it's the water that makes the blood flow. Had it not been for the water, the blood would not flow. And if the blood does not flow, you have a clot. How many of y'all know blood clots are not good? Okay, okay. So we really cannot establish who is family until we first establish godly bonds through friendship. Because it is possible to have family that ain't really for you. And yet have non-family members that will protect you and even die for you. I'm going to say that again. It's possible to have family that ain't really for you and yet have non-family that will protect you and even die for you. So when we say that blood is thicker than water, that is a fact. But the truth of the matter is, is you can't even establish blood without water. You cannot establish a family bond until you first establish a friend bond. So you have to establish the friendship before you can assess who really is family. We can assume it to be the one that we grew up in the house with, right? Because we got the same parents or same mom or the same dad and 
in the world system, absolutely, that's your family because y'all share the same parental units. But in the kingdom, he says, those that do the will of God is my family. Yes, that is my earthly mother. That is my earthly father. That is my earthly sister. That is my earthly brother. But if they're not doing the will of God and somebody else is, that is my brother. That is my sister. Tough word. I know it. I know it. But it's the truth. And so Jonathan did not care that his father was king and that his father was his dad. What he cared about was who's in the will of God and that is who I'm going to establish my bond with. I wish we had some friends like that, right? Yeah. Come on, somebody. That, that'll look past the other relational stuff, that'll look past all the flaws and look past all the other ugly stuff and just simply say, you're in the will of God. No, you're not perfect, but you're in the will of God. And because that I'm going to stick closer than a brother, I'm going to stay with you and we're going to work through this thing together because we're brothers, we're sisters. But we can't get to that point until we learn what does it mean to be a friend. In many ways, Jonathan was a counselor. He was a guide. He was a comforter. He gave wisdom. Sounds familiar. <laughs> he poured into David at his weakest points because he realized that as your friend, I have to speak to the king in you. Yes. Yes. Not to where you are right now. Yes. See, not too many friends is going to get that. I know that one day you're going to be the king. So while you're distraught about everyone who's coming against you, let me remind you of the king that you are. So that you don't lose your mind in the process. He had to protect David from the pursuits of his own father whose plan was to destroy him. How many folks in here is willing to sacrifice your own relationship with your father, your mother, your sister, your brother to protect somebody that didn't grow up in your house? We talking about friendship. We talking about what love looks like in a friendship. And it's tough because if you know for a fact that you're in fellowship with somebody who has a calling on their life that God has ordained, but yet you got people that's real close to you that's persecuting them. Sometimes we just stick with our people because that's our people. No valid reason whatsoever other than I grew up with them. That's, you know how we say it, that's mama and them, right? That brother in law you know. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I grew up with them. I have a relationship with them because I know them. I'm familiar with them. But you, on the other hand, good luck. I'm going to pray for you, and I may not. But I'm not going to stand with you against them because I got to go home to them. See, Jonathan didn't get into all that. Jonathan says, I'm going to stick close to you. I'm going to be your friend. And there's only one way I know how to be a friend, which is to long suffer. That's the only way I know because that's, that's the godly way is to long suffer. See, long suffering has no validation unless you got issues. Anybody here got issues? I know I got some. So that's how we got to get back to what does it mean to be a friend? Does it mean to point out your flaws and then run? And find somebody else that don't have flaws? <laughs> Good luck with that. Good luck with that. We've seen it time and time again. Relationships start and stop only because they found out or it was revealed that the person is imperfect. No long suffering. No sacrifice. Mm -mm -mm. Proverbs 17 and 17 says, A true friend shows love at all times and is a brother who is born for times of distress. That's when you find out who your brother is. That's when you find out who your sister is. It's in times of distress. When the world is coming against you and all hell's breaking loose in your life and everything is just falling apart and then you start to reveal how you handle stress but then your friend can look at you and say just calm down it's only but a season. Come on weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning. See, that's when you realize who your friends are. But when those other folks look at you and they say, oh, I thought you was a Christian. Oh, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause Jonathan could have said that to David. I thought you was a Christian. You around here acting all crazy because this is going on, that's going on. You ain't, man, I can't hang out with you. You a hypocrite. Jonathan stuck close and said, no, we are gonna get through this together. Anybody want friends like that? 
come on, that recognize that I'm not perfect. I'm going to make mistakes. I've made some and I'm probably going to make a whole lot more. But in the process, I need you to stick with me and help me get through this thing. Come on. If Jonathan had not been a friend to David, who knows how David's life could have turned out? Because David developed, obviously, some psychological issues behind the problems he faced. And Jonathan knew this, so he had to know when to be there for David. And he also had to know when he wanted better for David more than what David wanted for himself. Now, this is a hard place to be as a friend. You ever been in a situation before? Anybody been there before? When you want more for your friend than they want it for themselves? And you fighting and you pulling and you toiling and you losing sleep and you crying and you hurting and you putting yourself in all kinds of binds trying to help somebody else, but then they don't even want to change themselves. Jonathan, well, he found himself in that situation. I'm here with you, man. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to do all these different things with you. And I'm going to show you in the scripture in a minute how he had to pull away. Sometimes good friends pull away. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes good friends have to pull away. Why, why do you have to pull away? See, because sometimes we can get in the way of God. Sometimes we can try to become God thinking we can change you when in reality we can't change anybody, can we? We barely can change ourselves, let alone somebody, somebody else. And so Jonathan hit a season where he realized, listen, all right, you, you, I love you. You're my brother, but I got to pull away for a minute because you're going too far. And I'm going to show you where, that, where I can back that up in the text. Mm. 1 Samuel chapter 27. Let me go back here. 1 Samuel chapter 27. Hmm. See, Jonathan realized, David, you're going a little too far. And you started to pull me in the wrong direction. So I'm going to pull back a little bit. Okay? Because there's somebody that can help you. There's two friends that, that David had to rely on. One of them was Jonathan. But see, when Jonathan reached his wits end, he realized that he reached his limitation. There was somebody else that had to take over. That other person was God. Hmm. Come on. The other friend, the main friend that should have been the first friend, was the one that he now has. Oh, you know what? I'm going to pull back. God, you got him. That's your people. That's not mine. So I'm going to let you handle that. So in chapter 27, this is where David started to go and shift in the wrong direction. Verse 1, I'm going to read a couple of different verses. I'm going to start with verse 1. It says, but David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up his searching for me anywhere in Israel and I will slip out of his hand. So he stopped even conferring with his friend Jonathan. He started thinking to himself. He's already mentally in distress and now he's taking his own advice. You ever, you all know what that looks like? Yeah. You are mentally distressed. You are just not in your right mind, but you still want to take your own advice. <laughs> Come on, if that ain't insanity, I don't know what it is. You know you are not in right sound mind in this part of your life, but yet you're going to take your own advice and leave Israel, your homeland, and go to the land of the Philistines. Wait a minute. Just 10 chapters ago, you defeated a man named Goliath. Oh, come on. And the Philistine army. And now you're running to them for cover. That don't make no sense. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this for a minute because you're, you're, you're David. Everybody knows you're the next king in line, right? Everybody knows that you are king, but, and you defeated their entire army, and now you're running away from your people to them saying, if I come to you, will you protect me? Church, we got to get it together. When you leave, come on, this is Israel, this is God's people. When you got to run away from God's people to seek comfort to the enemy's people, that's a problem. But for him, it made sense because Saul was after him. Unrelent I mean, it was relentless. He just would not stop pursuing him. And so Jonathan realized mentally, man, I'm trying to work with you. I'm trying to long suffer with you. I'm trying to sacrifice with you, but you just on some other stuff. You talking about going over there, over there. Over there. I mean, you talking about going over there. 
I can't bother with you no more. I'm going to leave you alone. And so David followed his own mindset and decided to go and dwell with the Philistines. And he lived with the Philistines for about a year and a half. I believe it said a year and four months that he was living with them. How many of y'all know that when in Rome, you do what Romans do? Amen. So here he is now living in Philistine with the Philistines. And he has now taken on the mindset of the Philistines. He's out there. I mean, he was a rebel. He went from being who we know him to be as King David to now I got to fit in with them or else they're going to kill me. So now he's out ravaging towns, killing women and children. It's all in the book. Y'all Y'all just, just go on through chapter 27. You'll see it. <laughs> it's, in, it's in the book. He's killing all these people so he can fit in with the Philistines. It's the same David that we we don't talk about this part of David. We talk about how he, he cheated on, you know, how he, he, he slept with the woman and killed the husband. But yet he was a great king. We forget that he went through a valley season, too. He turned away from God at one point as well. But the beautiful thing about him turning away from God is that God never turned away from him. And so this is where I'm trying to get with this thing that even though you might have a worldly best friend, somebody that might fight with you and go to war with you. But at some point, even that friend is going to walk away. But even when they walk away, I have a God that will never turn his back on me. Amen. Amen. He left the people of God and went to God's enemy, became friends with God's enemy. And before he went, God made a promise to him that you will be successful in everything you do. But the truth of the matter is, even when he was with the Philistines, everything he set out to do, even though it was evil, he was still successful. <sighs> Are y'all hearing this? We got a friend in God that will never break a promise. And he will keep his covenant no matter where you go. He allowed David to be successful even though David joined allies with the enemy. Every, and it says it in the Bible. It said he was so successful that Saul kept elevating him. He was so successful that even when he was in the Philistine army, every land that he went to conquer, he was successful at conquering the land. That was a covenant that God made with him long before he left. So I want to encourage somebody here today that no matter what you do, no matter where you go, if you're a child of God, there's a covenant that God is not going to break. You might have to go through a season where there's punishment. You might have to go through a season where there's consequences, but it's all for the purpose of restoration. Yes. He cannot lie. He cannot. The Bible, we talk about how, how he says that gifts come without repentance. God's gift to you. He's not snatching it back because you acted up. We do that, don't we? I bought this Nintendo for you for Christmas, but you acting up. I'm taking it back. Right. I said Nintendo. I'll tell you how old I am. <laughs> come on. But. But here's the truth of the matter. This is how we parent our kids. We raise our kids that I'm giving you a gift based on your good behavior. I'm taking it back based on your bad behavior. And so naturally, if that's the way we think and that's the way we teach, that's the way we're going to see him. We're going to see him as a God that gives us gifts because of our good behavior and then snatch away the gifts because of our... That's not the God we serve. Mm, mm, mm. So even though his poor judgment, even though it was understandable, not only did God keep his covenant and friendship intact with David, the promises of God for David never changed either. He was destined to be king of Israel because God said so. Understand the power of God's words when he speak. When he speaks, he doesn't speak and. Eh. When he speaks, is in stone. He's declaring. He's decreeing. When he calls you the next king, I don't care what you try to do, you're going to be the next king. When he tells Jonah, Jonah that you're going to go to Nineveh and preach, I don't care how far you run and how, how many whales you jump in, <laughs> Come on. you're going to go to Nineveh and preach. When God speaks a word, it is a command. It's going to be carried out regardless of what you think or how you feel and how you act. Yes. Anybody with me today? Yes. Mm, mm, mm. Goodness gracious. So, so this entire life of David, he had two friends that he could count on. At least he thought he could count on, right? 
One of them was Jonathan. Jonathan helped him get through the rough beginning stages of his life, of, of this persecution. But then Jonathan faded. But then he realized, wait a minute, I've got God. God is still here. Jonathan stayed in Israel. God came with me over here with the Philistines. Wait a minute. So who was the better friend? I got a friend of mine. I told y'all this a long time ago. A friend of mine was when we were having conversations, another pastor. He said, he's like, pastor, I'm with you when you're right. But if you're wrong, I ain't with you. <laughs> How many of y'all know I don't need you <laughs> when I'm right? <laughs> can, can, can we just keep it 100 for a minute? I don't need you when I'm right. I can be right all by myself. It's when I'm wrong that I need you to be in my corner. See, and that's the problem that, that David ran into with John. See, when he was wrong, at first he was with him, but when he was wrong, wrong, yeah, <laughs> then John said, no, this is too much for me. I got to go. But we serve a God that whether when things are good, he's with you. When things are bad, he's with you. We got friends that when things are good, they're with you. But when things get bad, they leave you. But one thing I do know that God made a promise of, he says that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And that means even when you acting like a little butt, <laughs> And you know right from wrong. You know what my word is saying. You know the conviction of the Holy Spirit is working in you, but yet you still choose to go in the other direction. I'm still with you. I may not be pleased with your behavior, but I'm still with you. You might be going to the land of the enemy, but I'm still with you. Because even though you're over there, my promises for you are still intact right here. Mm -mm -mm. My, my, my. I praise God for staying in covenant with me. Anybody grateful that God stayed in covenant with you? Yes. Yes. Praise God. My, my, my. Proverbs 18 and 24 says it like this. One who has unreliable friends. Come on, somebody say unreliable friends. Unreliable friends. So one who has unreliable friends soon comes to a ruin, but there is a friend yes. who sticks closer than a brother. See, some of us have been through the betrayal, been through the attacks, and been through the persecution from folks who you thought was your friend. But I came by to tell somebody today that God has a sacrifice in position for that situation. <laughs> so, so here we go. The word said that they were unreliable friends. The fact that they were with you in the beginning phases of your mess, he says they're still friends. Get this. When you were making these crazy decisions and you were just, what's the word? You just won't listen. You're hard headed, right? You're rebellious and all that stuff. You still have some folk that stuck by you in that stage. And God says, I'm going to qualify them as a friend. But watch this, though. When it got real rough. And, and, and that's when the sacrifice had to come in and the long suffering had to come in and they bailed on you. That's when they became unreliable friends. Some of us got friends that are unreliable, but we haven't labeled them as unreliable yet because we're still leaning on them a little too much. There are some people that might be in your circle right now that are with you when the shallow troubles come, but then as they get deeper, they're going to fall away. God is saying, be alert of who you got in your inner circle. Even Jesus didn't let everybody in his inner circle. Come on, somebody. He only had a few that he allowed to be in his inner circle. And so, mm, mm, mm. God Almighty. Jonathan, as good of a friend as he was, was still unreliable. As good of a friend that he was, and we all know the story about this, and we think about Jonathan as being a great friend, there's absolutely no way he could be as good of a friend to you as God can. Amen. There's no friend that you, got, that you have and that I have that could be as good of a friend to you as God can. Because that's when the folks closest to you, when they walk away from you, God never will. And even this, watch this. When you turn your back on God, his covenant will still cover you. Mm -mm -mm. When you call on the friends that you have in the earthly realm, there's a friend in the spirit realm that will say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Anybody know that friend? 
Does anybody know that friend? Does anybody have a friend in Jesus? If you got a friend in Jesus, just shout Jesus real quick. Jesus. Come on. If you got a friend, shout Jesus real quick. Jesus. See, because we have a, a friend in God that will never leave you nor forsake you, no matter how bad you could be. And sometimes we try to put on this beautiful fit, you know, this beautiful spiritual fit that I don't make mistakes. And if I did make mistakes, it wasn't my fault. It really was. Yeah, I know how I go. And because we want to make sure that we don't lose our covenant with God. But God said, just be 100 with me. Just, just keep it transparent. I can see right through you. The reason why you called, you had these sins and you, you went through all these is because of the issues of your heart. I knew that when I formed you. So you didn't got a front for me. Just repent and let's get this thing back together because my covenant will never change with you. Yes. If we can get that in our mind and get the understanding of that, we'll stop making excuses for our imperfection and we'll just embrace it and just keep running back to the throne of grace. Amen. You can make reckless decisions, but he'll still protect you. You can squander your birthright and he'll still restore you. You can be a bad steward, but he will still provide for you. Oh, my God. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's the kind of friend that we need. And that's the kind of friend that he is. It feels good to have folks in my corner to comfort me when I need comfort, to encourage me when I need encouragement, to sharpen me when I get a little dull. But even through all that, I've learned one thing, that can't nobody do me like Jesus. Y'all ain't ready for that. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Anybody know that song? Can't nobody do me like Jesus. See, y'all don't know the word. Y'all supposed to jump in and sing with me. Y'all don't know the word. <laughs> can't nobody do you like Jesus. And if we could just get that in our spirit and just understand that, that we'll stop looking for all these different friends. Well, and I'm not saying don't be, you know, don't be friendly, but I'm just saying we, we put too much trust in man, not even realize they might have more issues than we do. Let's make a declaration today. That God, no matter how ugly and how arrogant and how rebellious I might get. I'm going to make sure I come back to you. I'm going to make sure I come back to you. My declaration today is my imperfections will not stop my pursuit of God. Amen. My imperfections will not stop my pursuit of God. I'm saying this over and over because I need it to get in your spirit. My imperfections will not stop my pursuit of God. David stopped pursuing God. He went to the Philistines. But God's grace stayed with him. His favor stayed with him. His mercy stayed with him. And if those things can stay with him, even though he wasn't pursuing him, imagine what it would look like for you if you don't stop pursuing him. Y'all with me today? Yeah. Yeah. Give God some praise, y'all. Yeah. I've got one closing today. Praise God. Amen. Come on. I know it, Mark. I know it, brother. I'm using y'all. Just for y'all that don't know, I usually got three or four closes, but today I think I have one. I'm saying I think. Who knows what the spirit gonna do? Oh, you, know, you know, we gotta blame it on the spirit when we go too long. <laughs> We've got a friend that sacrificed for us, and um, he sees all the ugly in us, but yet he stayed. Yet he stuck around. Come on, somebody. That means something. Y'all know it. Y'all know it. When, Think about your relationship that you've been in when somebody get to see the ugly in you, but they stuck around. That meant something. How much more when God who can see everything that nobody else can see in you, the depths of the ugly, right? But yeah, he says, you're still my child. I still love you. I'm not going to change the plans that I have for you based on your behaviors because you're mine. It's, it's got to feel good to know that you belong to the, the most high God. And he says, no matter how bad you behave, you're mine. He never, not once, stopped calling David his son. Not once did he stop calling Israel his people. 
even though they couldn't get right. Come on, somebody. That was a nation of can't get right if you ain't ever seen one. <laughs> and he knew that going in, and that's why he had to establish a covenant. Because y'all ain't going to, it's going to be thousands of years before y'all get it together. So I got to make sure I put this covenant in place. Because there's going to be a lot of y'all that slip up along the way. And it's not going to be fair for the ones that hadn't come yet to miss out on my blessings because of y'all. Right? Or us. I'll say us. Right? Praise God for that. That's something for us to be excited about. And in all my imperfections, his love for me never, not once, wavered. 